Hi guys. So after having watched Objectified, I want you to think about the idea of industrial design, furniture design, interior uh, design, and interior architecture as compared with regular architecture, so to speak. And the way I want to frame this is by looking at Mies van der Rohe's work, particularly the Farnsworth house. So we're going to kind of just breeze through some of his earlier work as a comparison point to the Farnsworth house. And Mies van der Rohe is a kind of typical modernist. He's a big influence, um, part of the Bauhaus. You remember him from learning about the Bauhaus. He runs the school for a little while. He moves from Germany to the U.S. in 1944. And we can see his career really take off. He is well respected in the U.S. He runs the Illinois Institute of Technology which is an architecture school in Chicago, um, and a lot of his first work in the U.S. is in Chicago. So the image on the screen here is um, Mies when he is, at some point later in his career, standing with a model of the Crown Pavilion, which is a building on the IIT campus, which he creates. Okay. So moving forward, Mies, um, is somebody who is not a theorist, he doesn't write a lot, we don't have a lot of written work from him, but one of the earliest theoretical projects we do have from him is before he has built work, um, is this particular skyscraper drawing. Notice the scale of this drawing, it's 68 inches by 48 inches, so this is comparable to like one of your midterm boards or final boards that you print out, but it's just one large pencil drawing. Um, and in this, he's looking at, um, well, he's creating a new idea about skyscrapers, and this is really a glass and steel building. So the idea of a skyscraper existed at this time, but Mies believes it hadn't been fully um, explored and that the new materiality of the steel frame and the glass curtain wall hadn't yet reached its potential. And so this is his design on how, um, how those materials could reach their potential, and we'll see this doesn't ever really get built, but a version of this does get built later on. And then looking at his work in, um, in Europe, we have, I show this, this house, the Tugendat house, which I show as a contrast to the Farnsworth house, which is primarily what we want to look at today. But the Tugendat house is, at the same time as Villa Savoie, it's really in this late 20s, early 30s time period finishes in 1930, and Tugendat, I think, is very comparable to some of Le Corbusier's early work, um, which shares this idea of the roof garden, the separated roof garden, and the free plan, even some ribbon windows, but here in Mises' work, the idea of the ribbon window is actually really a full height window. It's not just um, a kind of half wall window, it's a floor to ceiling window. And this is very typical of Mies, who's going to embrace glass, and much more so than Le Corbusier will embrace glass as kind of the all-encompassing um, curtain wall material. And the idea of mass and solidity versus glass that exists in this home will start to disappear as we look at his future work. There's also a clear relationship with the ground and relationship with the landscape that this project contains. It's sitting kind of heavy in the ground. There's a lot of massing. Um, as this connects to the ground, and we have some solid connection to the landscape, which really disappears in all of Mises' work in the U.S., and this has been theorized as a display of his discomfort, maybe, with living in a new country, or as a display of his um, tentative relationship to his new country and culture, so he's treading very lightly on U.S. soil. Although, I don't know, it could also just be stylistic and aesthetic. We don't ever have him admit that this is about any sort of deeper feeling, more so than just style. So looking at the plan of the Tugendhat house, oops, quick, you can see the plan has um, some kind of clear things we would expect here within the idea of the living, dining, and kind of public space. There's a little bit of a music space or sitting room over here. Very light um, walls. The walls are independent of the columns, so the columns here are just outside the walls. You can see that right here in these kind of curved forms, similar to the way Le Corbusier is creating his own plans at this time. So I think that you can see a huge connection between their early work. The interior, however, is very clearly Miesian. 
Um, and these chrome-plated cruciform columns are one of those immediate signatures that should show you that this is nice, along with the kind of full-height glass wall. And this interior also is signature Mies with the stone um, plating on the wall to the left, the carpet as a room framing device, his own Barcelona chair furniture, um, the chrome plated column again, you can point out the velvet. You can actually see the red chair in the background is made of velvet. He likes richness of material and luxurious materials. Um, and he's using these in the Tugendhat house. I should say his use of stone, which we see in the Barcelona Pavilion also, skillfully, masterfully, um, is related to the fact that his father is a stone carver, and that's really his first job is to apprentice for his father. So this is not an accident that stone floors, stone walls show up in a lot of his projects. Okay, and then Lakeshore Drive, the Lakeshore Drive project here is the first realization where he's trying to realize this glass and steel skyscraper. Um, in the mid-50s, this becomes the precursor to the Seagram building, and these are two apartment towers. They're uh, 29 stories each, and they're apartment blocks that he kind of explores the idea of the steel exoskeleton frame and the floor-to-ceiling glass window. If we look at the plan of these two structures, you have 860, which is the smaller building, and 880, which is the larger building in the site with a courtyard. So it's not taking up the entire area of the site, which is important. Um, Lakeshore Drive in Chicago is right along the lakefront, and you can see this image showing the placement of our two towers, 860 and 880, as they sit um, in, in conjunction with the city. So this is a beautiful day in Chicago. They're not all like this. Um, but those two towers sit, and you can see the kind of existence of them within the city and how the, the taller buildings around it have grown up since then, but how this was really a feat of realizing his goal of steel and glass skyscraper. And the windows here, I should say, are in contrast with the Seagram building. So one of the things that stays um, continuous in his design work is this black steel I-beam that is actually decorative. In this case, the wind, the lakefront position of these buildings has a lot of um, potential for the building to move, and so this is a bracing for the, the shear load that the wind puts on the building. So it does help stabilize the building a little bit, but it's it's basically ornament. And this is something that is a signature Mies move. We'll see this in his future projects. The one thing that never happens again in these projects is this two-tone contrast between the aluminum frame window and the black steel. Um, interestingly, I think he very much is minimal in terms of how he approaches um, color palettes and material palettes. So we, we never see that again. This is kind of a, a moment for him, never to be repeated. Dare I say a mistake. Um, and then the floor plan of these interiors are interesting in their own right because this is an early exploration of an open floor plan. You can see that these spaces, this is the 860 building, which is the smaller building, um, allows each of the units to have a corner so they all have corner windows. You can see the structure um, separate from the glass curtain wall, the interior core of, of hallway and elevator versus stair. So there's circulation at the center, and then everyone has a glass corner in their own apartment unit. So this, the three-bedroom apartment is not any bigger in square footage. It's just got more bedrooms. And notice the bedrooms are really pretty tight. There is still a master suite um, with its own kind of walk-in closet space and ensuite bathroom but the bedrooms just get tighter here. In the open apartment, the bedroom really isn't even kind of its own separate room, and then you have different versions of that here. So he's exploring um, the domestic within these lakeshore towers, and I get to the point of what I wanted to talk about today here, which is Farnsworth House. And the Farnsworth House um, is something you may have heard of when you studied Philip Johnson's glass house in your Studio 2 project. I believe that was Studio 2. And you had to study the interior of this. Philip Johnson's glass house essentially stole the idea from Mies van der Rohe from the Farnsworth house. You can see the construction here is 1945 to 1951, or I should say the design and construction. Philip Johnson sees Mies's Farnsworth house in a exhibition in the MoMA that he curates. So Philip Johnson actually invites me to participate, sees a model of the Farnsworth House, which is this first all glass house designed in the US. 
And then in 1949, Philip Johnson goes and builds his glass house. Um, and you notice the date of 1949 is two years prior to when the Farnsworth House finishes in 1951. So Philip Johnson basically steals this idea and goes and does it first, and then um, hogs the media attention and, and claims to have the first glass in the U.S., the first glass house in the U.S., which he does, but he uh, steals the idea. So they, they end up becoming friends. Um, Philip Johnson spins this as copying is the highest form of flattery, and essentially Philip Johnson invites Nice um, to work on the Seagram building, kind of hands him a huge client, one of the most important buildings of his career, and essentially makes it up to Nice Van der Rohe. So funny little interpersonal story there. But the Farnsworth House itself, I think, is incredibly relevant after having just watched Objectified. This is a piece of architecture that I think is as close to industrial design as it gets. Um, and that's my argument. In the Objectified documentary, the framing of industrial design is really geared towards pieces or objects of industrial design that follow the kind of less is more moniker. This is me who actually said less is more keep in mind. Um, but objects like the Apple products that believe in minimalism or Dieter Ramses' work, the, the head designer of Braun, all of these are very pared down, kind of scaled back uh, ideas about design. There's no excess and that's the point. And so if we are to look at architecture as part of this discussion, which Objectify doesn't quite get to, kind of barely, um, I think that this house could easily be argued uh, as kind of a larger scale product of industrial design or at least sharing those principles of minimalism that we see in the documentary. So the Farnsworth house is designed for a woman who's single, she's a doctor, she lives in Chicago. This is supposed to be her weekend retreat, it is just for her, she doesn't have a family. So the idea of freedom and flexibility of the program is clearly paramount in this home. Um, Philip Johnson's glass house was also just designed for him. He was single, he didn't have a family, so there are immediate parallels. Um, but Edith Farnsworth uses this as a weekend retreat. So there aren't needs um, that necessitate a lot of storage or closet space or um, necessarily like living space this is a retreat space which I think allows Mies to be very flexible with how he uses the space and what he creates here. I'll show a couple images of this. This nighttime image I think is gorgeous but also highlights maybe the perils of living in a glass house in the middle of 10 acres of farmland essentially on the Fox River in southern Illinois as a single woman. I think it might actually be a little frightening, but I don't know that she ever felt that way. Um, and then in the winter, we can see it here. And one of the interesting problems with the Farnsworth house is that the river floods. And the river floods quite routinely. Um, I have here some of a map, somewhat of a map here. So the river is actually down here. You can see the Fox River. Uh, which is a pretty large river in Illinois, is down in the southern part of the site. A, this line that you see here, is the high water mark that happens up here, it says, for a few days every year. And that gets 14 feet above river level, which is very high. B happens only when ice freezes and then breaks, um, and 16 feet above river level. And then C is the highest water mark that's ever existed here and this is 20 feet above river level. So Mies does a thing where he puts the house beyond the water, or the flood line, essentially. Um, and I think he thinks he's being clever by elevating the whole home so that it becomes free from flooding, but actually there are moments and times when this water actually seeps into the home. You can see the curtains are tied back here in preparation for more flooding. So over the years, they have had to spend a lot of money restoring this. Um, there's a foundation that owns the property now. It's a museum. You can go visit it. I highly, highly suggest you do if you're ever in Chicago and have a free morning or afternoon. It's incredible. It's one of those spaces that actually over-delivers when you're there in person, truly. Um, so the floor plan here, you have a lot of outdoor space. You have terrace space that's covered by the roof in 
the or connected to the main living area and then an, an outside terrace that's not covered by the roof. And the interior floor plan is, I think, in some ways akin to um, Le Corbusier's idea of a machine for living because you see a couple areas here, dining room, or no, this is office space, or no, sorry, dining area up here, office space down here, um, living area over here, and then bedroom area over here. And this closet slash wardrobe feature kind of moves in and out, um, isn't always there, it's, it's flexible. And then you have the mechanical core of the home. And in the mechanical core of the home, um, two bathrooms, one kitchen, and a fireplace, and then a little bit of storage space here. So this is essentially all of that program that he would need to hide or, or protect from the idea of this kind of open glass floor plan. So looking at our interior images here, you can see again he's bringing back the stone. There's a uh, travertine on the ground. He loves this stone. Floor to ceiling glass windows, aluminum frames. The details are impeccable. I mean, the framing and the detailing of this structure, part of what makes it so special. He creates all the furniture for the interior, so you can see his tubular steel dining chair here with leather, um, and then the table that he designed. So all this furniture is his along with the mechanical core. So he treats the mechanical core, I think, as a piece of industrial design. This is a functional core for the home. And each of the items here is custom made. So this isn't just um, what exists in the world, how can I order off the shelf parts and achieve what I want to achieve. This whole thing is so highly customized and so highly detailed. And I think as uh, students of interior architecture, really looking at this mechanical core, um, I think should be inspiring to you. If nothing else, I think should should beg the question of, is this industrial design? Is this interior architecture? Where's the boundary? How do you separate these two concepts? Because when we look here at the kitchen, so on the left, you can see the kitchen is just a galley kitchen. It's in the back end of this um, mechanical part of the home and the cabinets here, very small little poles. Um, cabinets all are kind of as understated and as minimal as possible. The materiality continues, the wood never really breaks up. There's lighting um, integrated into this so you don't have to have extra lighting in the kitchen. And the countertop at this point is revolutionary in terms of its placement. It's one big custom formatted um, steel countertop. And you can see the burners are built into this. The sink, this picture on the left shows us, the sink actually um, has indentation marks on the left and on the right so that if you're drying dishes and you place dishes next to the sink on the right or the left, the water drains right into the sink. So he's thinking about these details and the ergonomics of use just as an industrial designer would. And the, the burners being built into this um, is supposed to produce one big sheet of stainless steel that then is easy to clean. You can see this is in remarkable shape. Um, I don't know that Dr. Edith Farnsworth used this a lot, used the kitchen a lot, but stainless steel is hygienic, it's easy to clean, uh, and he succeeded at what he set out to do here. So this kitchen, despite the fact that it's from the 1950s, I don't even think looks particularly dated. Um, I think this is a really well done use of minimalism in comparison to kind of Dieter Rams projects or Johnny Ive projects. I think you could put this Mies van der Rohe kitchen in that same category because he's working with similar ideas. So then back into the house, back into the other side, the mechanical core here, you can see the bathroom door opens up. Let me just get a peek into the bathroom here. There aren't really great images of the bathrooms online, but they do hold up pretty well if you if you search for any images of the bathroom. Um, I think they, they really look pretty good still. All the furniture in this space is his, the tubular steel, the uh, lounger, and then the, the Barcelona furniture over here. This is the kind of desk office area space. Um, this is the living room space, which is denoted again by this carpet that he uses to imply the room. There's a fireplace just under here, which in this image you can't see very well but in the next image you can see very well. That's this fireplace that I'm talking about. 
and the fireplace chimney is hidden again in the mechanical core. So this does continue all the way to the roof, but that offset is meant to kind of obscure that relationship. So it looks like it's floating within this house, which is floating within the landscape. Um, and this is part of the concept of the house. So you wouldn't want all of this space to go to the roof if you want to work with this idea of the floating concept. And then the bedroom here is just an implied space. This is a door that gets you into the, the bathroom connected to the bedroom. Um, this is his own lamp that he makes and connects here, but the kitchen is right on the other side of the bedroom. All of the curtains here open and close. Um, so the house itself, I think, is a piece of industrial design. I want to know, do you guys agree? And is this the realm of interior design and interior architecture, or is this really the realm of industrial design? I think there is a separation, and I want you guys to think about what that separation is, and if we should pay attention to it and obey it, or if we shouldn't. Okay, that's your response for this week. I'll type that up.